Hi, and welcome to Chapter 12. Today we'll be talking about investing in stocks. So there's a number of things that we're going to cover today. We're going to look at, of course, investing in stocks, how to read a stock quote, understanding how stocks are valued, um, looking at different investment strategies with stocks, understanding the risks of investing in stocks, um, thinking about the stock market overall and the risk and return involved, and sometimes it's all about making a fortune, which can happen. But making a fortune in the stock market is a slow and steady process, not an overnight process. So when you buy stock or common stock, you're basically purchasing a small part of a company. You're becoming an, a small uh, part of the ownership of the company. You're basically an owner of the company. But this doesn't really um, grant you that many rights as an owner. So as an owner, you would have the right to um, vote as a shareholder and receive dividends or income from the company if it's issued. You can't walk into a McDonald's and say, hey, uh, I'm an owner of this company. Give me a free lunch. You know, you're just a very, one of many, many, many owners. Now, what's great about this is as the company progresses and grows, so does your stock price. And that's how you make money in stocks. But that's what we call capital appreciation. When, this, when, you, when you're able to sell the stock at a higher price than you purchased it at. Also called capital gains. Now, Dividends are also a, a source of returns, and many companies will pay dividends. Although it's not the biggest source of returns, it's you know can be anywhere from one to five percent, depending on the company. Um, but neither of these are guaranteed. Dividends are not guaranteed. Neither is it guaranteed of the stock price going up or capital appreciation. It's something we hope for, and if all things go right with the company, it will happen. But if you know, if the company goes bankrupt or they have some financial trouble or the, the market is shrinking, there could be a lot of reasons why the company's stock price doesn't go up. Now, the board of directors will be a deciding factor in uh, the dividends and when they're paid. Uh, and capital appreciation takes time. As the company grows, it's not a straight line. There'll be ups and downs on the stock price. Um, but generally, if the company is moving higher in sales and profits, the stock price should follow. Okay. So why consider stocks? Well, the, I think the number one reason to consider stocks is because they're the best chance you have of outpacing inflation. So stocks historically have returned a greater return than inflation. Now. In addition, over time, stocks have the best return compared to all other <clears throat> investments that you can access as an individual small investor. They, you can reduce the risks through diversification. Stocks are very liquid. You can just buy and sell them and convert them into cash um, quite easily, Monday through Friday on most days. Um, and the growth in these Share price is determined mostly by the strength of the economy, uh, unlike bonds, which are determined mostly by interest rates. So if we look here, here's the growth of $100. If you invested $100 in 1951, today you would have $99,000 in the stock market, the New York Stock Exchange. So you go from $100 in 1950 to $99,000 today. Um, if you did that in the government bonds, it'd be four thousand. In treasuries, it'd be fifteen hundred. And in inflation, a thousand dollars in nineteen, uh, hundred dollars in nineteen fifty is roughly a thousand dollars today. So you can see that stocks far and above surpass all other investments in return, and that's why it's generally most financial advisors would advise you if you're just starting out in your investing and you have. 30 to 40 years before you need to use this money to save for retirement, having majority of your income, in, your savings in stocks is a no-brainer. It's recommended. So here's a checklist, an investment progress checklist. So is the return on, the, on your investments meeting your expectations? Uh, is the investment performing? 
as you would hope or believe. So this is this number one in the checklist. This should be checked in annually. You shouldn't expect things to happen in a daily or monthly uh, progress. It takes a long time. Now you, you definitely, if you invest in the company, you want to make sure the company is making money. And it, it's compared to the competitors in the industry, it's one of the top companies making the most money. Okay, now, how much money will you get back if you sell the investment today? So you look at your progress or your return, how much you're paying in commissions or fees. This would be more like with a mutual fund of stocks. We'll talk about that next chapter or so. Um, have, your goal, have your goals changed? Is the investment still stu suitable for your risk and your time frame? Um, and when do you decide to sell? So I would say for many great companies and good stocks, You, you don't want to sell too soon and keep, you want to hold them for a longer time frame. Uh, and if you're holding a stock for a long time frame, say 10 or 20 years, this is where you're going to get the most return on average, uh, giving this, you know, these great companies a long time to grow. Now, of course, if something fundamentally changes in the business model that's going to make that make the company unattractive moving forward, you should sell. Uh, but you shouldn't sell if there's a stock market decline or crash this would be an opportunity where you could pick up more shares and this is what we call dollar cost averaging averaging where we're investing in these companies on a routine basis through high stock prices and low stock prices it guarantees that you get um, a, an average stock price that's going to be most times your average cost of buying the stock over time will be much lower than the current return on that stock so investors that invest for the long term reap the highest rewards. Uh, short term investing is definitely a much more difficult environment to make uh, big returns. So I usually discourage people from saying, I'm going to decide to sell the stock as soon as it makes 10% or 20% or 50%. Because really great stocks can go on to make, you know, um, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000% returns if you just give it a chance. So let's talk about the language of common stocks. We have limited liability. It means that as a shareholder, you can't be sued uh, for any misdoings the company does because you're really not involved in the day-to-day -day decisions for the company, so you have no liability against lawsuits that hit the company. Um, as far as claim on income, this would be dividends. So with the stock price, they, the, there's a date they declare the dividend. There's a date that you have to buy the stock before the dividend rights are separated. So the ex-dividend date is really basically you have to own the stock up until this date to receive the dividends. Uh, there is a claim on assets, but typically um, other there are other more senior claims like bonds or other bank loans before the, sh the stockholder can get uh, any money from a company. Other senior uh, claims on the assets would have to be paid. And this would be in the event of a bankruptcy. Now, you also have voting rights. Most stocks and most classes of stock will have uh, some sort of voting rights. And these are, you know, every so often you get a chance to vote, usually annually, for new, new people in the board of directors or major initiatives for the company. The, when they say a stock is going to split, and there are a number of stocks uh, recently that have split, and this is just really breaking the stock up evenly, uh, you're not really getting anything of value here. So if you have a two for one stock split, what is going to happen is if you have a thousand shares at, at $500 a share, a two for one stock split is basically going to mean that you're going to have now instead of having a thousand shares at $500 a share, you're going to have 2000 shares at $250 a share. So there's no real um, gain in money. It's just that sometimes share prices get too high and they want to break the stock up to a more optimal share price. Because typically people have a hard time buying a share of stock when it's $1,000 or $1,500. Uh, so having a stock, uh, price of stock somewhere around $100 a share, $50 to $100 a share makes the stock more purchasable. And that's sometimes why they do a stock split. 
Now, stock repurchasing, if someone's going to re, you know, if the company decides to repurchase the stock, it's a way of saying they, the company's management believes in the stock. So what they're basically saying here is, you know, the share price is fair or maybe a little bit undervalued. We have some extra money and we're going to repurchase shares of stock. And that's good for investors because that puts extra demand on the stock and usually makes the stock price go higher and also shows management's belief in the strength of the stock. Now we have book value. And book value is simply the assets minus the liabilities is the book value or sometimes called equity. So, if, And if you divide that by the amount of outstanding shares, you can get a book value per share. So you can kind of compare this to the share price to see if you know, if the book value is $10 and the share price is $15, share price should always be above the book value. Because the book value is just the, you know, if you take all the assets and you sell them, you pay off all your liabilities, how much money is left over for shareholders? The company should be worth much more than just the book value. So most companies trade at a multiple of anywhere between times 2 or times 10 the book value. If a company has a book value higher than the share price, that's a problem. There's something very wrong with the company because um, that generally is not the current state of 99% of the stocks out there. Earnings per share. This is a big uh, financial ratio. We're looking to convert the earnings into a per share basis. So we simply take the net income minus any preferred stock dividends because that's another type of liability divided by the number of uh, shares of common stock and this gives you the earnings per share. Earnings per share goes up, generally the stock price goes up. So that's why investors are very interested in what the earnings per share will be from quarter to quarter, year to year. Now a dividend yield, this is something that we, we look at the return of the stock's dividend in a percentage basis. So a dividend yield is, uh, say it's a $10 stock and they're going to pay a $1 dividend. That's a 10% yield. You just divide the dividend by the stock price and you get the dividend yield and just gives you a percentage of return that the dividend represents. Market to book or price to book ratio. Again, this is look at the stock price compared to the book value per share. And this is what I was talking about before, that multiple. So if the stock price is 20 and the book value is 5, the market to book ratio is 4. And remember I said uh, most companies are going to trade between 2 times or maybe even up to 10 or 20 times the book value. It just means that if the, if the market to book is very high, it just means that there's a high value placed on the future prospects of the business above the actual book value, of the current book value of the company or the current equity of the company. Now, we can classify stocks in, in a couple different ways. We could call stocks, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of stocks out there. So we could say stocks are fit into a blue chip and a blue chip means these are the best, biggest, most reliable, financially stable stocks. Where do they come up with the blue chip? Well, that's in uh, a poker set you have. You might have blue, red, white chips, and blue chips are the most expensive, most valuable chips. Uh, speculative stocks. These are stocks that might have a very bright future, but currently are considered somewhat risky. So they're speculative. There's not their, their guarantees are of future success are a little bit, uh, probabilities are a little bit lower than say just regular growth stocks. So speculative stocks are ones that, you know, if they turn out to be uh, the, the big idea that everybody thinks, they could be very big stocks or they could just fade away. Now, a growth stock is a stock that's currently in a growth phase of revenues or earnings or both. Um, typically, we would consider a growth stock a stock that's growing in earnings more so than sales. But generally, it's hard to grow earnings without sales. So growth stocks are some of the most uh, sought-after stocks because if the stock is growing, uh, it's going to attract more investors and create more demand for the share price. And typically, growth stocks have a very high valuation. Okay, here's some other stock classifications. So we talked about the blue chips, the growth stocks. There's also income stocks. These are stocks that are relatively stable stocks that pay very high dividends, like utilities. We, ha we talked about the speculative stocks. We have the cyclical stocks, and these stocks tend to move 
um, earnings move with the economy. So if the economy is growing, the cyclical stocks, they grow too. So they're closely tied to spending and the growth of the economy. Now defensive stocks are stocks whose earnings are a little bit more independent of the economy. And they either perform consistently or maybe sometimes do better. So, so examples of defensive stocks could be uh, medical equipment, pharmaceutical, food, food uh, fast food restaurants. These are all things that continue to do well even during a recession. Uh, now, if we talk about caps, market caps, a market capitalization is basically the total value of a company's uh, share price times outstanding shares. So we can break stock, stocks up to three size categories, the small cap stocks, the mid cap, and the large cap stocks. And this is really just you know breaking all the stocks in the market up into, into three, three different classifications. And it's just looking at the relative size. So think of stocks into three thirds. A third of the companies would be considered small cap, a third would be mid cap, and a third would be large cap. Now, we're probably very familiar with stock market indexes and averages. And this is just a, it's basically a way to measure and track the stock market. So they take a group of stocks and to represent the market. So we, on a day-to-day -day basis, we could see overall how the market is doing. And the two most popular are the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which represents 30 stocks, and the S&P 500, which represents 500 stocks. And these are ways on a daily basis we can kind of get a feel for if the stock market is up or down. Now, a bull and bear market. These are, these are terms typically thrown around and talked about consistently in the stock market. So a bear market is... Uh, a falling prices, falling stock prices. So when the market is down more than 20%, we could see that a bear market. And bear markets can go down 20% down to 50 or 60% down from their previous high position. Now a bull market is considered rising stock prices. So in any 10 year period, you would most likely have two years of a bear market, eight years of a bull market. And you know, in any 20 year period, there might be four years of bull market, 16 years of bear, uh, I'm sorry, four years of bear market, 16 years of bull market. These are just on average, you know. And this is overall why you wanna stay invested in stocks long term because most stocks have a more positive years than negative years. So probably it's, I would say it's a good time to start investing during a bear market. So if you're new to investing and it's a bear market and stocks, you know, are down a lot and there's a lot of depressing news and no real uh, incentive for people to go out and buy, you know, there's no real, I wouldn't say incentive, there's just um, no real interest in stocks. That's a great time to get started because most prices are depressed and it's a good time to get into the stock market. Uh, it's difficult, you know, um, to watch your stock prices fall during a bear market. So actually most investors get into investing during bull markets when this FOMO, fear of missing out occurs where you feel like you're missing out, everybody's making money in the stock market and you're not. Uh, so when you can see that over a 10 or 20 year period, you're gonna make, most years you're gonna make more money than, uh, than the years where you're gonna lose money. So that's why it's important you know, even if you just start investing and there's been three good years and suddenly you get into one or two bad years of the stock market and the bear market, you want to hold your positions and even grow them during the bear market. Because when it gets back to a bull market, you're going to make even more money. So this dollar cost averaging where you just put the same amount of money in the stock market on a weekly or monthly basis and you do that for the rest of your life will guarantee that you're not going to lose a significant amount of monies during the bear markets, that there'll be opportunities to get even more shares and more acceleration of return during the bull markets. Okay. Now, um, this is uh, a little hard to see in the video. You might, if you, if you go to your textbook, they're going to have this open. You can go and see something similar, but this is looking how to read a stock quote. So basically, if you go to um, say Yahoo Finance or many websites, they, they'll give you a chart. And the chart will be something where you could see the change in stock prices. And this is a five day change. You could set it to a month, a year, six months. You can have the stock symbol, the stock name, the exchange it's traded on, 
um, a day a range for the day, a high and low, a 52 week range, what's the lowest and highest over 52 weeks, the day's volume, the average volume, the market cap, this is 144 billion, the PE, the earnings per share, dividend yield, and the ex dividend date. So this is just you know basic information you get from a stock quote. And that's your first stop, generally your first stop when Let's go back here. That's generally your first stop when you want to review or think about buying a company. The first stop is to look at the stock quote. Where where are we at in the basic the basic fundamentals? Now, as far as the, what we call a valuation of common stock, when we say valuation of common stock, what we're really talking about is is the stock price fair and a good price to buy the stock at. Now. Fundamental analysis is more of an accounting-based uh, analysis where we're going to look at the, you know, the fundamental balance sheet income statement cash flows to help determine um, where the company is today. Are they, are they, are they growing? Are they likely to have you know, uh, future earnings based on you know their growth tra trajectory. How are they doing on their financial ratios? Financial ratios are a measure, a quick measure of the success of financial statements. So we can look at a company fundamental analysis through you know year after year, or uh, the company compared to competitors. So a fundamental analysis is really using the accounting information provided from the company to get to an to analyze is you know get an idea is the company doing well are they moving forward are they financially stable have they made progress in their earnings and their revenues have they controlled their liabilities so fundamental analysis is really just understanding the fundamental financial aspects of a company and this is gives us an idea of is this company financially strong or are they financially in trouble now a technical analysis is more um, analyzing supply and demand for the stock price. We, we look at the amount of people buying and selling the stock. We look at changes in the graphs or charts of the company. So technical analysis, it does have nothing to do with accounting or financial ratios. Technical analysis is really the following the movement of trends and using past trends to hopefully predict future trends. Now, the PE ratio is a very common valuation indicator and it it really tells you how how much investors like the stock so the higher the pe the more the investors like the stock you know um why is that well if investors like a stock they buy more of it and the stock price goes higher and as the stock price goes higher, since you're taking the stock price and dividing it by the earnings per share, you're naturally going to have a higher PE ratio. Um, and firms with a high PE ratio generally have a high growth in earnings, a high growth in revenues, and a high potential for future business. Um, now, companies with lower PE uh, are going to signal maybe a slow growth company, a less exciting company, companies that investors aren't as interested in owning because the company may be um, fairly valued or don't have a lot of future potential, it's just not as exciting or as volatile. So PE is a good measure of how well the com company is liked. But you know, PEs change over time. So if you look at the average PE, this is 1990, where the PEs were like about 15. Then 92, they got up to over 25, and then back down to, say, 18 or so. So what makes the P average PE multiples change? Well, uh, if there are, is this a growth in earnings? Um, investors start buying, investing in stock greatly. This is going to move the, this is for the S&P 500, the PE mark multiples higher. Now. You can have a situation of a bubble where P multiples can go much higher. Uh, this generally, when this generally happens, is followed by a period of correction. 
So if the p multiples are very high, there's usually a period of correction. Uh, or if there's a financial recession, like there was in this part of the 2000s and then back here in 2008, you're going to see a correction of the p multiple as people are moving their money out of the stock prices and earnings are going lower based on you know, change in perceptions of the stock market. <clears throat> so if we look at a SWOT analysis, this is going to uh, look a little bit more deeply into the company when you do uh, a SWOT analysis. So we're going to get to the SWOT in a second. Um, so we look at strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. <clears throat> so this is a way of taking a company, so we'll say Netflix. What are the strengths of Netflix? They have a large um, amount of company-owned content, and they're investing a lot of money in content, and they have a large subscriber base. What is a weakness of Netflix? There's a lot of new competition. Paramount Plus, Disney Plus, Hulu, uh, and others in this uh, HBO Max, of course, in the streaming area. So that's a weakness. Opportunity. There's still, you know, uh, 8 billion people, 9 billion people on the planet that they could sell Netflix to. So they still have a large uh, amount of in possible investments to make. They can change. They have the opportunity to make their business model more attractive, maybe having a lower price or an ad-supported price. Um, they have the ability to... <clears throat> um, they have a, you know, a certain a size of their company. They're large enough to have enough money to acquire other companies if they want to expand their business. Uh, threats could be the entrance of <coughs> new uh, streaming services, brand new streaming services. It could be uh, another threat could be uh, receiving less content from existing content providers as they team up with other streaming services. So you get the picture. It's just really a SWOT analysis is just getting a better handle for the company's current position. And this would, you know, if things are looking really good with a SWOT analysis, that would say another factor in the idea of buying the stock. Okay, so SAR stock investment strategies, um, there's, there's multiple approaches you can, you can utilize. Um, number one, you, you want to be alert. So you want to be up on the financial news and you want to be up on the companies you know, uh, annual reports and quarterly meetings. Uh, so you want to know what's going on. Now, one of the best strategies is dollar cost averaging. And this is the practice of investing a fixed amount of monthly, money, say weekly or biweekly or monthly, into the stock market in a continuous basis. So you invest $1,000 a month in the stock market continuously, we're, and you're going to be buying stock when the stock is higher priced, when the stock is lower priced. So you overall dollar cost average is one of the safest strategies, you know, because it would be the, one of the worst things you could do is put all your money into the stock market one day and the stock market goes down 30% in the following month. You know, it's very devastating. So slowly moving your money into the stock market in, in a dollar cost average uh, method will prevent, you know, any of these... Um, you know, large losses of, of money when you suddenly put a big chunk of money in the market. Now, the buy and hold strategy is a great strategy, something that I myself believe in. And with the buy and hold strategy, what you're doing is you're buying great companies. So uh, you're not, you're buying very good companies that have a very good future and you're holding them for a long period of time. So this will protect you from, um, the downfalls of market timing. So when people try to do market timing, they typically sell at the worst time, buy at the worst time. So you can't time the market. So it's going to protect you from market timing. Um, now, it's also going to protect you from taxes and uh, commissions and fees. So if you buy a stock and you hold it, you really don't have to pay anything at that point. So there's no taxes due, there's no other fees due. So buying holding is the most cost effective. Um, so you, 
And then if you combine the two, buying a stock, holding it, and then dollar cost averaging more shares over time, and just never selling stock but accumulating more of it, you could do very well. Just imagine how well you would have done if you owned 20 years, 30 years ago, you owned net the FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, which is Alphabet, um, and just kept dollar cost averaging into them as they had 20 years of uh, stock market gains. Um, so buy and hold is the best strategy. The only thing you have to be careful of is once in a while a company will just be no longer a good company. It just it, It's rare, but it happens where a good company moves down the wrong direction and invests in the wrong area or just makes products that are not good. You know, somehow the management goes bad and you need to get out. So that, you know, if you have 20 really great stocks, probably one of them is, and during your lifetime, you'll need to di divest yourself of it and move into something else. Now, there's also um, dividend reinvestment plans. So a dividend reinvestment plan, sometimes called a drip, is where you buy stocks directly from a company. So say you go to McDonald's or Exxon or Disney, you can you buy your stocks directly from the companies. You avoid the broker, you avoid the, um, the stock exchange, you buy it directly from the company. Then the um, and you reinvest your dividends. So whatever dividends the stock pays automatically gets reinvested in new shares. Now the benefit of this is that you're going to be buying the stock at a at, without fees or commissions, and sometimes with a discount. Sometimes these companies will provide a discount, and it. The downside is that if you have ten. If you're involved in 10 drip programs, that means you're going to get 10 tax statements. You're going to get, you know, you're going to be obligated to, um, um, you know, track these all separately. Rather than if you own stocks in a brokerage account, everything gets tracked continuously together, and you get one tax statement and one monthly statement. So the paperwork can be a little bit more daunting in these dividend and reinvestment plans. But and it's and some of them may also be difficult to join or get into, and you may have to be an employee to participate. So it's a very small area of investing that most people don't really get involved with, because of the all the extra work it takes to get in there. And generally today, with the low, the low commission rate or the zero commission rates that that uh, we're charged, the dividend reinvestment plans aren't as attractive as they used to be. So let's look at each of these a little bit more in depth. So when it says to be alert, um, this means that you some some things to look out for. Uh, you want to look out. You want to look out for uh, any significant change in the company, uh, a new direction, uh, going into a new product, changing the fundamentals of the company. You want to um, you never want to really be influenced solely by somebody else's sales pitch for the company. So you don't want a, another person or or a stockbroker to really sell you in a company without doing your own research. Um, if the if the company just looks too good to be true, every you know the you know the stock price is doubling every six months. It, it you know generally these hot white hot stocks burn out. So you'll be careful of what's really the super hot stock of the month. Um, make sure that you don't do excessive number of, of uh, transactions in your account. Um, that's going to you know, generate a lot of commissions and tax taxes. So you really want to do that more of a buy and hold situation. Um, you don't want to ever be put in a situation where you're pressured to buy or sell a stock. So you got to be careful if you're dealing with a stockbroker or other family members that, you know, are pushing you into buying or selling things. You want to be, you do your own research and double check all your own math and everything. Okay, just getting back to dollar cost averaging. This is just a reinforcement of what I said before. You, you know, you pitch, you're going to purchase a fixed amount of stock every month, say a thousand dollars worth. And as the stock market goes up and down, you basically wind up paying an average amount. So if you follow this method, you're always going to be your average buy of a stock 
should be lower than the current stock price over time, given enough time. Uh, so, you, so generally when the stock price is lower, you're buying more shares. When the stock price is higher, you're buying less shares at the high price. And this helps to keep you your average price purchase price lower than where the stock price is. And it keeps you from trying to time the market or, you know, if, if you miss five or six of the best days of the year in the stock market, you can miss 50% of the return that year. So that's why you want to be continuously invested. Uh, and this is just an example of a, a dollar cost averaging schedule where you're investing money over time. The buy and hold strategy, which I was talking about before, you just you find great companies. This is sort of what Warren Buffett does. You find great companies, you keep invested, you, vo you avoid timing the market. This is, helps to minimize your, your transaction costs. It reduces your taxes on capital gains. Um, and you just continue to, you know, hold the stock. Uh, and I've made plenty of times I've made mistakes where I've bought, I purchased stocks and then sold them after my money doubled. You know, for example, split adjusted, I purchased Apple at six dollars a share and sold it at twenty-one dollars a share. I thought I was the smartest investor, and now that stock is over a thousand dollars a share. Um, and I, I've done that multiple times with other companies like Netflix and Google and these are all and Amazon and these are all companies I should have held on to for the long term. So I learned the hard way to buy and hold after buying so many excellent stocks I knew would do well um, and holding them for the long term. So sometimes it's trading is a great way of making mistakes and learning from them. And I've made probably all the mistakes you can make trading stocks. So trust me when I say buy and hold is a great strategy. The dividend reinvestment plans I went over uh, before, and it's really just um, a way of buying stock directly from a company and having the, the dividends automatically reinvested and buying more shares of the company. This is something that 99% of stock investors don't do. I wouldn't recommend it. I think today, with today's low cost environment and zero commissions or low cost commissions, you could easily, you know, um, and most brokerage firms will let you automatically reinvest your dividends in the company. Uh, so it's not as many uh, advantages to, to dividend reinvestment programs as there were 20 years ago. So as an investor, what should you know? You should know, get a general idea about the stock price. Is it a good price? Is it a fair price for the stock? So what's the value of the stock price? This is very difficult. It takes part experience, some mathematical calculations, um, understanding of finance and accounting. So you want to know to know if the stock is a good price, the stock, this is a question most people struggle with. So it, it's sort of an intuition or a sense you can get by doing the, the homework, the research and the financials and the financial ratios and comparing the stock's uh, fundamentals to competitors. Uh, quality. Uh, is the firm in position that's going to allow it to be, make money in the future? What's the quality of the products, the quality of the long-term prospects? Strengths and weaknesses. This is sort of that SWOT analysis. What are the company's really big strengths? Is it brand name? Is it customer loyalty? Is it market uh, penetration? And what are the weaknesses, uh, such as strong competitors? Uh, opportunities and threats. What, where can this company move in the future? And what are the, you know, the opportunities they could move into? So if you look at SpaceX, they have a lot of opportunities in selling internet um, through their um, groups of satellites. Threats, there are competitors. Amazon's looking to do the same thing. Okay. So risk associated with common stocks. So principle eight, risk and return go hand in hand. So what this basically means is that, you know, stocks that are risky, they're risky for a reason. Uh, and you can el eliminate a lot of the risk by diversifying your investments. We talked about it last chapter. Um, so if one stock goes bust, another stock investment soars, hopefully that makes up for it. And Peter Lynch, a fa famous mutual fund manager and stock investor, used to say, if you only have to be right six out of ten times, 
So if you, if you buy 10 stocks and six of them you were right about, you hold those stocks and you move forward with those stocks. If four of them you were wrong, the market never developed, the, the, sta the sales never grew, uh, you sell them and then those are mistakes and then you try to buy you know, hopefully another 10 stocks and maybe six of those you'll be, be good. So, it's, so you, don't have to be, you don't have to be right 60% of the time to make a lot of money in the stock market, according to Peter Lynch. But diversification is a great way. You, know, you might have, if you have just you know, one stock that goes from $10 to $700, that'll more to make up for a number of stocks that you know, went from 10 to $5 a share. You know, that probably could, if you had 20 stocks in your portfolio and 19 of them went from 10 to $5 and one of them went from $10 to $700, all the profits in that one stock were more than make up for the losses on the other 19. So diversification really helps to minimize your risk. Here's a pretty classic schedule of risk and expected returns. So these are less risky investments. Uh, these are all bonds and government treasuries. Then you have your preferred stock. What is preferred stock compared to common stock? Preferred stock just gives you a guaranteed dividend, and the, the preferred stock price isn't as volatile as the common share stock price. So the com and preferred stock isn't as common either. There's not that much of it out there, and most people aren't invested in preferred stock, but it generally comes with a guaranteed dividend, um, and mo most of its value is derived from that dividend. Where common stock, most of the value is derived from the company's future success. And then small company stocks tend to be a little bit riskier because they don't have as much uh, reserve to, to maintain the, the direction of the company if they have a small uh, downward period of sales and profits. So small companies can be a little bit riskier and a little bit more vulnerable to competitors. So what is beta? Beta is... Uh, beta, the beta coefficient is a measure of how your stock responds to in relationship to the market. So if your stock has the same exact returns as the market, the beta would be one. If your stock has a beta greater than one, it's going to be more reactive than the stock market. So for example, if your beta of two, stock market goes up 10%, your stock goes up 20% on, uh, on average. If uh, based on past activity, it's no guarantee of future activity though. If your stock has a beta of 2 and the stock market goes down 5%, your stock's likely to go down 10%. And if you have a beta less than 1, your stock is going to move up and down with less volatility. So the higher the beta, the more volatile your stock is, the more it reacts to changes in the overall stock market. And the lower the beta, the less reactive. It can even be a negative beta where it moves in the opposite direction of the stock market. So beta is a good measure of risk. It's a good measure of uh, volatility basically but it's all it's all based on past past volatility so it's no not 100% guarantee what's going to happen in the future now short term investment investing in stocks can be very risky because in the short term you never know when the next bear market or market crash is coming so if you're only looking to invest for a year you could be in some real real shocks or surprises could occur that could lose a lot of money in that year so i wouldn't i wouldn't invest I wouldn't suggest investing in stocks unless you have a five to ten year investment horizon. So the longer you hold stocks, this is going to reduce um, your risk and the variability of your your annualized returns. So if you hold a stock for ten years, you're going to ride out the the bad years and really gain in the good years. Um, so the longer your time horizon, uh, the more opportunities you have to um, save, reinvest, uh, buy new stock, um, and you have more opportunities to um, work on your knowledge of the stock market, your knowledge of the company, um, so time, so having a longer time horizon can basically make up for a lot of the hiccups along the way. So that's why probably the best investment decision is to say, okay, I have 40 years until I retire. I'm going to start off my retirement uh, mostly, if not 100% in stocks, because I have such a long time horizon 
that's going to give me the biggest return and over that time period, the lowest amount of risk. So if we look at the range of returns of a 50 year period, we see this is this 50 year period. We see that in one year, there could be a 30% 30% plus or minus change in your overvaluation of your stocks. So if you put a million dollars in stocks for one year, you could lose $360,000. Over a five-year period, the, you have the variation is smaller, and most of it is in the upward position. Over 10 years, very difficult to lose money um, in a 10-year period, and almost impossible in the 15, 20, or 30-year period to lose money. So the longer you have your money invested, the less risk you have of losing any of it. Okay, let's do a, um, a summary here. So we went over the basics of common stocks and how they perform over time as an investment. They're, they're, over time, they're the, I would say, the only investment that truly can outpace inflation consistently. They're very liquid. You can turn your stocks into cash within a matter of days. Uh, you have stock market indexes and averages to help you track the health of the, the stock market on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, monthly, yearly basis. Uh, common stocks can be broken up into different subcategories, blue chip, speculative, defensive, large cap, small cap. Uh, and a lot of mutual funds are set up this way too, where they follow a particular stock market class. Um, there's a number of methods you can use to determine the value of the stock. Uh, interest rates and risk, expected growth, um, are all things that can affect the stock price. So understanding how stock prices change, and remember I had, I had said basically it's a supply and demand equation. If people buy more shares of stock, the stock price will go up. If people sell more shares than people are buying, the stock price will go down. So it's purely supply and demand. So what? So you really have to only look at what encourages someone to buy a share of stock. Well, if the company's making money, has a great business model, has good future perspective, um, has good products, that's gonna encourage people to buy the stock and move the stock price higher. So it's all about what the company does and how they perform is going to translate into people's demand for the stock. Now, using some common stock investment strategies such as dollar cost averaging, buying and holding, uh, reinvesting your dividends is a sure way to, to guarantee success and returns in the stock market. The, um, I would say a sure way to lose money is day trading. And I've never met a day trader, and believe me, I've worked with thousands of students, many of them who were day traders, never met a day trader that walked away after a five-year period or six-year period with a profit. Yes, they might make money in a few months, a couple months, even a couple years. A year or two, they might be consistently making money, but they're only one stock, one bear market or one stock market crash away from losing all of their gains in the past five years. So, so day trading is... is very speculative, gambling almost, and I, like I said, I've never met anybody who was consistently successful as a day trader. I've met plenty of people that talk about all their big wins and how they're making all their money and really promote how smart they are, and even some people that quit their jobs to do day trading. But this does not last long because you have all you have in most days you have a majority of your capital at risk, and just one bad day or two or one bad week it could wipe out a year's worth of gains. So um, stocks are risky, but diversification definitely helps. Long-term investing helps. And understanding the value, how beta measures the volatility of a particular stock, gives you ideas of the risk. The higher the beta, typically the riskier the stock. OK. The, I uh, hope you found this helpful. It's just an, you know sort of an introduction, introduction to investing in stocks. Uh, but some things that you definitely, a couple of the things that you may um, want to avoid is excess, excessive trading. Because trading, if you find yourself trading every day or even every month, you might be trading too much. You're costing a lot in transaction fees and taxes. Um, you want to be aware of people's hot tips or the you know the hot stocks of the month. They typically burn out pretty quickly. Um, Setting your goals and understanding how you can utilize an IRA or a 401k plan is, is a great way um, to facilitate dollar cost averaging and lowering your taxes and costs. Um, keep in, and just keep in mind that 
you know, the stock market can be a, a mind game and it, the human aspect of investing is what makes investing so difficult. If you were a computer and you just bought based on more logical approaches, you do very well. But because emotions get involved, greed, fear, uh, anxiety, this makes you mess up. And so if you have a good plan and a good strategy and you stick to it, you'll have a better chance of success. Um, and you got to be careful of what we call a herd behavior, which is uh, following everything the herd does. So sometimes this is what creates bubbles where everybody's buying, buying, and, and that's what the herd is doing. Uh, and then the stock market crash comes and then everybody's selling. This, if you follow the herd, that means you'll be buying at the highest prices, selling at the lowest prices. That's why dollar cost averaging helps you to avoid this herd behavior. And a lot of people experience this loss aversion where the, um, joy from gaining money is not is as large as the pain from losing money so you typically sometimes will let you make you hold on to losing stocks hoping that eventually you'll have a gain and it just this loss aversion emotionally can mess with how you trade so if the more you can divorce your emotions in trading and be more of a logical cool headed consistent trader, the more likely for your success in trading in stock. And that would be, that's some, actually some very good advice. Um, so just remember there's, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, you gotta be aware of these really hot momentum stocks. The best thing you could do, the best advice would be if you look around the world today, what companies are really making great products that you like or a good, a very smart retail store or online or online retailer, or, you know, and just see the companies that in your everyday life makes a difference to you and start there as far as thinking these companies are ones you could think about investing in. And sometimes the more boring the company is, the better return the companies have. And you don't really have this overinflated stock price of people just investing on what's really hot and new. So, Investing in stocks often takes many years to get the experience it's to start investing uh, and making a lot of returns. So if you're investing in stocks, the first two to five years you may not do as well. This is where you're making a lot of mistakes. You're learning from your mistakes. Uh, and when you lose money from a mistake, believe me, you learn that lesson. And then if you stick with it through time, you will become a successful investor. The people I generally see losing out are the people who get involved in the hot stock market. A bear market comes along, they lose a lot of money, and they just sell everything and give up on stocks for a lifetime. This would be a, a big mistake. So this is why you want to be slow and steady and invest in stocks at a gradual pace for a long term and not just put all your money in stocks one day and hope for big returns. And then when you're disappointed, move all your money out of stocks. That's what how most people wind up uh, never getting the full advantages of being in the stock market. Okay, uh, thanks for your time. I'll talk to you soon.